we're recording, so go ahead. Welcome to Tom Talks. We've had uh, quite a long uh, pause between our last one. Was that in August, Jackie, or sometime sort of late, late summer? But the, you know, the fall gets very, very busy in natural areas management and uh, and education and everything else. So uh, we took a took a breather, and now we're back. And I'm glad to be back. We're going to talk about. Uh, um, well, Ra Raquel, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be joining Tom today in this Tom Talks um, special edition, I'm going to say it is, um, just because it's a little different. Um, so my name is Raquel Garcia Alvarez. I also go by Rocky. Um, she, her, hers, ella are my pronouns. I'm part of the Racial Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee with the Forest Preserves of Cook County. And I'm also the founder of Environmentalists of Color and I acknowledge that I'm a citizen of both Turtle Island, which is the United States of America, and also Mexico. So thank you, Tom, for sharing the space with me today. Okay, thank you for taking part and helping. Yeah. Uh, we have a number of volunteers that are gonna work with us today. Jackie's not technically a volunteer, but I wanted to put her name there somewhere. Um, um, because we're gonna be listening to the voices of a number of people today. Uh, uh, a number of uh, actors in the history of conservation and the historians that chronicled them. But uh, Raquel, would you like to say a few things about this? Yes, so before we start the official presentation, we just like to do the brief acknowledgement that the Forest Preserves of Cook County created. Um, the Forest Preserves of Cook County acknowledges that we are in the ancestral homelands of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwa, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi tribes and a place of trade with many other tribes, including the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Menominee, Silk, and Meswaki. And if you would like to learn more, you can go to the Forest Preserve's homepage and um, search for the acknowledgement statements as this is a li living document that was also made in collaboration with many of the Native American partners and indigenous people that continue to call Chicago home and um, live among us. So. That's it, thank you. And also we created these norms for courageous conversation for today, just because this may be the first time you may be hearing things a little differently. So you may get triggered. So we just encourage you that you come curious and you engage deeply, make no assumptions except good intentions, acknowledge your privilege and power and listen and pause before you try to defend. Uh, we encourage you to speak for yourself, not for a group, use I statements. I think what I heard you say was, and also welcome paradox, either or, either or thinking can limit our ability to dialogue and learn. And again, these are, we're, we're sharing the history through the voices of the individuals who lived during that history. So this graph just represents that um, usually we like to be in our comfort zone, but this presentation may bring you out of the discomfort zone, but that's okay because when you're in the discomfort zone, that also means that you're learning. So welcome that discomfort and just take a deep breath and before you may try to defend or, you know, but we welcome lots of good questions as well. So thank you. I would say the history of conservation to me is something that I've I thought I thought I knew about. Uh, I've in fact taught uh, a college course. Uh, I think that was the name of it, uh, or or it was very close to that when I was a professor at Northeastern Illinois University. Uh, but um, looking back on it now and uh, looking at, I've discovered. I, I think the whole conservation movement has begun to discover. Uh, a slightly different history. And it's what we want to talk about today. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been a journey for me over the last few months doing the research for this presentation. I think it will be something of a journey for everyone who's listening. I think it's a good journey because I think it, it, it prepares us for the conservation of the future, which I think is the most important thing. Um, my, this, is, this is something I've dedicated about the last 40 years of my life to, and, I, and I, I'm unflinching in that dedication today. Um, and you should be. Uh, um, so, so I welcome you to, to listen and learn today. Uh, 
we're going to listen to the to people and the historians of conservation today, but all I can do is really sort of trace the broad arc of the mainstream of conservation, try to put it in the social context, which I think is very, very important to try to understand the world in which conservation was taking shape in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in particular. And then to try to find some voices that were left out of that con 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 conversation, because that's, that's critical to try to understand what our limitations are today. Well, and I like to challenge people with the idea that try to imagine a conservation is 10 times as large as it is today. Um, and then ask yourself, how do we get there? Uh, how do we, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it grows that much, it has to remove some boundaries and limitations that allow a lot of other people to join us who are not presently a part of the movement. So I wanna want you to approach listening to the, to the presentation today with that in mind. It's really about understanding our limitations. Yes, celebrating some of our achievements, but understanding limitations so that we can grow in the future. Um, these are key words in the history of, uh, of conservation, the idea of wildness and nature, um, wilderness, uh, and in one sense they seem obvious and uncontroversial because we're so used to them and we're, we're so used to one particular interpretation of them. But that interpretation really comes together as a part of the history of, of nature conservation, and they mostly trace back to the late 19th, early 20th century, our modern what we think of as our modern understanding of those words. Um, I'm going to read the first one. This is the Enabling Act for Yellowstone National Park. Being enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that the tract of land in the territories of Montana and Wyoming lying near the headwaters of the Yellowstone River is hereby reserved and withdrawn from settlement, occupancy, or sale under the laws of the United States and dedicated and set apart as a pub public park or pleasuring ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. And all persons who shall locate or settle upon or occupy the same shall be considered trespassers and removed therefrom. 1871. This is a uh, I mean, I'd like to, to, to think of this, this act of, of setting aside Yellowstone National Park as, as, and the Park Service likes to think of it as the original act. There are actually several that came before that. This is the one that, that, is the, that sort of starts the National Park movement. And, and, uh, and, and really all of our public lands from, from state, county and local level, municipal parks, all of them sort of trace their spiritual background or their spiritual ancestry back to Yellowstone. So this is an incredibly important event in the history of conservation in this country uh, in which we recognize that people come together and through their government set aside land uh, from, from, from consumptive uses. I mean, that, that, that principle is what's behind the conservation district, the Cook County Forest Preserves, all of our forest preserves in the Chicago area. But note, note the, the the, it announces a relationship to nature here. And all persons who shall locate or settle upon or occupy the same shall be considered trespassers and removed therefrom. So right from the beginning of the parks movement, we really saw people in nature as exclusive of one another. Uh, one of my favorite characters in the history of, well, in all nature writing and conservation I, is Henry Thoreau. Um, so I'll read this from his essay on walking. Eastward I go only by force, but westward I go free. The west of which I speak is but another name for the wild. And what I've been preparing to say is that mm. wildness is a preservation of the world. Every tree sends forth its fibers in search of the wild. Life consists with wildness. The most alive is the wildest, not yet subdued to man. Its presence refreshes him. One who presses forward incessantly and never rests from his labor, who grew fast and made infinite demands on life, would always find himself in a new country or wilderness and surrounded by the raw materials of life. He would be climbing over the prostrate stems of primitive forest trees. 
I mean, Thoreau is one is is you know given credit as the, as the early voice of the wilderness, um, and it's a powerful, powerful voice in the early history of what really wasn't even an identifiable conservation movement when Thoreau wrote these words. But what what is the wild here? I mean, east and west are, are obviously metaphorical and mean something. Uh, are referring to that wild, but what is the wildness? And Thoreau doesn't actually answer the question, uh, but he does He does say that it's really about the solitary man uh, encountering a new unpeopled country and surrounded by the raw materials of life. So, so here's, the, here's one of the, we're gonna run to a number of these nature, the, these wilderness tropes, these sort of ideas we attach to wilderness. And here's the solitary man encountering the wilderness on his own. Uh, it's a central trope of conservation that comes down to us in the present day. The world thus exists to the soul to satisfy the desire of beauty. This element I call the an ultimate end. No reason can be asked or given why the soul seeks beauty. Beauty in its largest and profoundest sense is one expression for the universe. God is the all fair. Truth and goodness and beauty are all but different faces of the same all. But beauty in nature is not ultimate. It is the herald of inward and eternal beauty and is not alone a solid and satisfactory good. It must stand as a part and not as yet the last or highest expression of the final cause of nature. Ralph Waldo Emerson from his essay on beauty. If Thoreau uh, saw that essence of wilderness in the solitary human human uh, encountering the wilderness, Emerson uh, gives us the message that, of wilderness as as the sublime, uh, and, and that that essence of wilderness, the sublime, in other words, pristine, untouched, virgin nature, uh, is is again one of those wilderness tropes we automatically associate with wilderness, even down to the present day. This is, this is where this is where these ideas are are starting to come together in the Western mind. Everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and cheer give strength to body and soul alike. This natural beauty hunger is made manifest in the little windowsill gardens of the poor, though perhaps only a geranium slip in a broken cup, as well as in the carefully tended rose and lily gardens of the rich, the thousands of spacious city parks and botanical gardens, and in our magnificent national parks, the Yellowstone, Yosemite, Sequoia, etc. Nature's sublime wonderlands, the admiration and joy of the world. John Muir from the Yosemite. John Muir has a has been a, a just one of the incredibly important characters in the history of conservation in this country, um, and we'll, we'll talk more about. Um, some of the controversy surrounding John Muir a little bit later in the presentation, but let's just take him on face value. He has always been the, the, gray, the gray bearded old man wandering around the Sierras. And, and I think that gives you a slightly um, incomplete view of who John Muir was. He was a, he was a successful businessman. Uh, he was a lover of new technology and an effective politician and, and a close friend of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, so he, he would, was both a lover of nature and loved to be outdoors, but he was also a very effective politician in his time. And here Muir celebrates that sublime nature, the magnificent, our magnificent national parks. And he celebrates them as a necessity of human life. And that's another one of those na nature tropes. And, and we'll, we'll come back to that later on in the presentation, that idea of, of this wilderness experience being really sort of fundamental and important to human life. The utilitarians. Actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. 
by happiness in, is intended pleasure in the absence of pain. It's John Stuart Mill from his book, Utilitarianism in 1861. And I believe it was his uncle, it was Jeremy Bentham, English philosopher, who said the greatest happiness of the greatest number is the foundation of morals and legislation. And then in our country, uh, starting early in the 20th century, but written down in 1947, Pinto said, Cons conservation is the foresighted utilization, preservation, and or removal of renewal of forests, waters, lands, and minerals for the greatest good of the greatest number for the longest time. Utilitarianism was a, was a Enlightenment idea, liberal philosophy of the 19th century, really focusing on the rights and freedoms of individuals. And you can see the very individual way this is, is worded, how we're maximizing the pleasure of individuals with all of our legislation and political uh, actions. Uh, and Pinchot, Gifford Pinchot, whose name will come up again, uh, a very effective actor in conservation, another friend of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, takes this idea of utilitarianism and turns it into a rational policy for the use of natural resources, um, in which he famously says, and I went through a forestry education, these words are like words from the Bible, the greatest good for the greatest number for the longest time. Um, Next section is on conservation and race. And this, is, this, will be a, this was a difficult section for me to put together, to do research on. And we'll, it'll be a slightly difficult, at least some of the slides for, for many of the people that are watching today. But I think this is, this is how we learn and grow is by facing things that, that are a little different than we thought they were. Um, uh, the, early, the 19th century in general and the early 20th century were just a very difficult time for race relations in this country. You could say all the whole time of the country has been a difficult time for race relations, but in particular these times, in the early 19th century, we had a war with Mexico and took 500,000 miles of land and added it to our country. Slavery ended in the middle of, this, of the 19th century, but was replaced by a Jim Crow uh, situation that uh, really established white supremacy as the unofficial law of the land. Uh, the last of the Native Americans were killed, subdued, removed, and relocated the reservations. So uh, without it, this, this, this is the backdrop of the beginning of the conservation movement. We can't, can't separate ourselves from that social background. Um, so this, what we're gonna try to do here is to try to understand the social context in which conservation uh, got together so we better understand the sh shared language and ideas we inherit from that time. And so now we're going to listen to a diversity of voices, both inside and outside of the conservation movement, to try to reflect that relationship of race and conservation. A Haunted Oak by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Pray, why are you so bare, so bare, O bough of the old oak tree? And why, when I go through the shade you throw, runs a shudder over me? My leaves were green as the best I drew, and sap ran free in my veins. But I saw in the moonlight, dim and weird, a guiltless victim's pains. I bent me down to hear his sigh. I shook with his gurgling moan. And I trembled sore when they rode away and left him here alone. They would charged him with the old, old crime and set him fast in jail. Oh, why does the dog howl all night long? And why does the night wind wail? I felt the rope against my bark and the weight of him in my grain. I feel in the throw of his final woe, the touch of my own last pain. And never more shall leaves come forth on the bough that bears the ban. I am burned with dread. I am dried and dead from the curse of a guiltless man. And ever the judge rides by, rides by, and goes to hunt the deer. And ever another rides his soul in the guise of a mortal fear. And ever the man, he rides me hard, and never a night stays he. For I feel his curse as a haunted bough on the trunk of a haunted tree. Thank you, Jackie. Um, 
Paul Dunbar was a, actually an internationally famous African-American poet from around the turn of the last century, uh, probably better known in Europe than he was in this country. Uh, and this is a poem pretty obviously about a lynching. Uh, it come, this comes from a much longer poem. The central verses really tell you the story step by step of the lynching in which the, the uh, judge, the minister, and the doctor are part of the lynching party. Really setting that this, the, there is both this darkness um, uh, of nature um, and human cruelty and the lone victim made all the more alone by all the authority figures of the town being a part of the lynching party. Uh, one thing you should know about the poem, the, the first and last verse you see here are, are, are said by the horse of the judge who leads the lynching party. And the central verses, which are many more than we see here, are all spoken by the tree. Uh, and so there's this, both the darkness uh, and the frightening nature, but it's nature itself and, and the spirit of the horse and the tree that are actually the only, the only uh, sympathy that the, the lone victim feels. Um, this, and the reason I put this in the presentation, this is, this is a part of the African-American experience of nature. It comes up, if you start doing research, it comes up over and over again. This is a part of the African-American experience. We may think of it as an interesting poem about a bygone era, but it's a part of uh, people's experience of nature. Hey, Tom, there's some yellow lines. Yeah. Might be a setting uh, in the bottom left corner, I think, on PowerPoint. Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to stop sharing. To, yeah, this. maybe stop sharing and reshare from. Okay. Maybe it's a Zoom setting. <laughs> yeah, we'll I, try it again. I know. I know there's a there's a function where you can put marks on there, but I didn't do anything, so I'm not quite sure. Um... Well, we'll reshare and hopefully oh, that. I think it went away. So. Yeah, it went away. You should be good now. Thank you. That coarseness and strength of the American character combined with acuteness and inquisitiveness, that practical inventive turn of mind, quick to find expedients, that masterful grasp of material things, lacking in the artistic, but powerful to affect great ends, that restless nervous energy, that dominant individualism, working for good and evil. And with all that buoyancy and exuberance, which comes with freedom, these are the traits of the frontier. Frederick Jackson Turner, historian from his talk, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, 1893. Very famous talk that Jackson Turner um, uh, did and it was published uh, as a talk. He really didn't write many books, but this talk in particular captured the imagination of Americans. And the first thing I'd ask you is, do you see yourself here? Because you should. He is describing, he's describing not only the American character, but the way Americans think about themselves. Practical, inventive turn of mind, quick to expedience or pragmatic, masterful grasp of material things, restless nervous energy, dominant individualism, I mean, and Americans are trying here to, to distinguish themselves from the Europeans who are bound by tradition and uh, more communal in orientation and uh, flaunting their artistic achievements and cathedrals, obsession with intellectual history and prone to philosophical reflection. I mean, the American is the opposite of that. And where we got that is created by this confrontation with the frontier, or another word might be wilderness. Um, this is what shapes a distinctively American character. Um, and so that, that idea of the wilderness, putting its imprint on us, the, 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 the culture of the United States is another one of those wilderness tropes. And it comes in, well, well that, one, that one again will come back later in the presentation. These are recycled over and over again. They're a part of, they're a part of our creation of, of the wilderness frontier in our imagination. Um, and so right as, the, right as the frontier is disappearing, it becomes the birthplace of America 
and it takes on a mythic importance and inestimable value right as it's right as it's leaving the stage. The world would probably have gone forward very little indeed would probably not have gone forward at all had it not been for the displacement or submersion of savage and barbaric peoples as a consequence of the armed settlement in strange lands of the races who hold in their hands the faith of the years. The wrongs done and suffered in the course of conquest cannot be blinked. Neither can they be allowed to hide the results to mankind of what has been achieved. Theodore Roosevelt from the winning of the West from the Alleghenies to the Mississippi, 1890. In the late, in the late 19th and earliest 20, 20th centuries, for me, one of the darkest chapters in the history of science, particularly in this country, is race theory. Uh, the idea that um, the human species is divided into distinctly different types and these types differ from one another in a wide, such, such a wide range of characteristics that we can, that we can um, arrange these different groups into a hierarchy from, from uh, top to bottom and using the, the, what was then the new Darwinian worldview of natural selection from the most fit to the least fit, from the most advanced to the most primitive. Uh, by the time race theory really becomes a political force in the early 20th century, it's already been abandoned by biology and anthropology, at least by the main uh, most important scientists uh, in these sciences. But it had already gotten, gotten hold of the imagination of the country and was frankly a scientific, uh, was used as a scientific just justification for racism. Uh, you notice how Roosevelt uh, gives the frontier a, a, a makeover here that uh, it's not just the confrontation with the frontier of now, but the, our superior race, the Nordic race, as he calls it, shaped by our, our uh, fighting, conquering the primitive people, the less, less advanced primitive peoples, uh, what we now call Native Americans. In North America. So it's a... Um, this is a way that race is being built into the, into, into the ideas of nature and, and the early conservation movement. Roosevelt was worried about the loss of a special American quality of strength and ingenuity that supposedly had evolved among whites on the frontier as Eastern European and Jewish immigrants flooded into the country with their big families and with the birth rates of white Protestant Americans declining, he warned of impending race suicide. He dispatched Pinchot to study the problem with the C Country Life Commission. Continuing that work, the American Eugenics Society, one of various such organizations to which Pinchot belonged, sponsored hundreds of bitter family contests at rural fairs wherein couples would take intelligence and physical tests and submit to medical exams to become certified as worthy for breeding. Charles Wolferth, Conservation and Eugenics. I have to admit, this, this, uh, I had already read the section when I was looking for images. And when I found this image, which is, uh, I think, 1920, it's uh, Kansas, uh, called the Free Fair. I think that's just a state fair. They still have free fairs in Canvas, and it's just a state fair. Uh, this was just an arresting image because some of the, I mean, it's, most of these people would have been slightly older than my grandparents had they been in the picture, but this is, this is not that far away from me. And, and yet eugenics, we, we th which is selective breeding of human beings to improve human beings as we might selectively breed cattle or corn, uh, it has been a topic, an untouchable topic since the middle of the 20th century. So to see it here, uh, it w was just unnerving and frightening, particularly, particularly its link to the conservation movement. Important, it's important to understand that eugenics was uh, announced by Francis Galton, a cousin of, of Charles Darwin in, in, uh, in the United Kingdom. They traveled to this country at the turn of the last century. 
and then became very popular and widespread, a really, really an acceptable part of popular culture. It doesn't mean everyone agreed with it. Certainly there were those who very much disagreed with it, but it was very much a part of the, of the of political conversation at the time. Uh, and then eugenics moved from here to Nazi Germany in the 30s with disastrous results. Uh, and oddly, it's, it seems so odd today. This is why it's so important to go back and look at history. It seems so odd. You could sort of think of this as some sort of fringe, fringe idea of extremists, but no, this was mainstream ideas and was a part of the progressive political movement thus embraced by Roosevelt, who was very much a progressive politician of his time. It goes along with ideas like women's suffrage and nature conservation, prohibition of alcohol, a fight against political corruption and monopolistic practices of big business. I mean, so it's what seems like, like fringe ideas today were actually mainstream politics at the time. So it would, in, in, one, in one sense, it would be unfair to demonize conservation for being involved in, in eugenics because it was such a popular movement and embraced, for instance, by the Episcopal and Methodist churches. Uh, and yet, and yet it'd be naive to, to think that every trace of these ideas, all this, this part of the conservation is simply just melted away and it's no longer around. This is, this is the reason we wanna go through these early years of the conservation, of the history of conservation is to try to understand how these ideas may have been started to be built into the story of conservation and how we think about nature and our relationship to nature and how some of those ideas may survive into the present. Summer in the South by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. The Oriole sings in the greening grove as if he were halfway waiting. The rosebuds peep from their hoods of green, timid and hesitating. The rain comes down in a torrent sweep and the nights smell warm and piney. The garden thrives, but the tender shoots are yellow, green and tiny. Then a flash of sun on a waiting hill, streams laugh that erstwhile quiet, the sky smiles down with the dazzling blue and the woods run mad with riot. Published in 1900. So this is the same Paul Dunbar who wrote that the, the dark, uh, sad poem, Let the Haunted Oak. Uh, really to me, re revealing these two, two aspects of, of, of nature um, uh, in the African-American uh, African mind. Uh, it's so starkly different. Here are rosebuds, peep streams, laugh, skies, smile, and the night smells warm and piney. Uh, so, so starkly different from the, from the dark and frightening nature of the first poem. Sir, all over the world, a race of soldiers, sailors, and adventurers and explorers, but above all, of rulers, organizers, and aristocrats, in sharp contrast to the essentially peasant character of the Alpines. A rigid system of selection through the elimination of those who are weak or unfit, in other words, social failures, would solve the whole problem of racial decline in 100 years, as well as enable us to get rid of the undesirables who crowd our jails, hospitals, and insane asylums. This is a practical, merciful, and inevitable solution of the whole problem and can be applied to ever widening circle of social discards, beginning always with the criminal, the diseased, and the insane and extending gradually to types which may be called weaklings rather than defectives and perhaps ultimately to worthless race types. The Passing of the Great Race by Madison Grant, 1916. This is probably the most frightening uh, section of text we'll confront today. Uh, and I put it in there not just to be sensationalist. Madison Grant was a prominent conservationist at the time, a founder of the American Bison Society, uh, I, I'm the director of the Bronx Zoo. Uh, he was just very well-placed conservationist and close friend of Theodore Roosevelt. So again, this wasn't a fringe, a fringe politician operating out of basements. This is this is a person in the mainstream of society and very important in the early conservation movement. And yet he 
writes a book that uh, um, some years later, Hitler, Adolf Hitler will call this his Bible. Uh, this it is so, so difficult for us to read today. Just, just it's an unfortunate, but a part of the history of the conservation movement. Harriet Tubman spent much of her young life in close contact with the natural world. Likely born in 1822, she grew up in an area full of wetlands, swamps, and upland forest, giving her the skills she used expertly in her own quest for freedom in 1849. <clears throat> her parents were enslaved, and Tubman's owners rented her out to neighbors as a domestic servant, servant as early as age five. At seven, she was hired out again, and her duties included walking into wet marshes to check muskrat traps. Tubman also worked as a field hand in timber fields with her father and brothers on the north side of the Blackwater River and at wharves in the area. All of this helped when later Tubman made 13 trips back to Maryland between 1850 and 1860 to guide people to freedom on the Underground Railroad. This is from Allison Key's book about Harriet, Harriet Tubman, an unsung naturalist. Is, a, is Harriet Tubman a conservationist? Um, probably not by uh, a narrow definition of that term. But Harriet Tubman's life, I think, re um, reveals a relationship with, with nature. Uh, and that's, that's why I put, put her in here. I mean, what I was, when I was putting this together, I faced the same dilemma I think a lot of people, um, a lot of white people face when they start thinking about these issues. They start looking for the voices of people of color and unconsciously what I was looking for were people that sounded like Henry Thoreau or John Muir or Aldo Leopold, I was looking for people that sounded like that because those, those, were, the, those were the important voices of conservation that, that are stuck in my head. And it was very hard to find any. Uh, and, and, then I, and then I ran upon a poem by Langston Hughes, and you'll hear that poem later in their presentation today. And, that, and that's, what, that's what made me realize I was looking in the wrong place. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the sublime in human nature, so so much in the in the foreground and background when when conservation was put together that comes to us from Thoreau and Muir and uh, Leopold and others um, seems to be absent and it's and it's replaced by a, by a nature that's that's more imbued and and uh, and is the is the scene of human life, um, a nature that connects lives and families. And generations together. And here nature really is the school that trains Harriet Tubman in her youth to later become a great American hero um, through her expert skills as a naturalist. The problem of the conservation of our natural resources is therefore not a series of independent problems but a coherent, all-embracing whole. If our nation cares to make any provision for its grandchildren and its grandchildren's grandchildren, this provision must include conservation in all its branches, but above all, the conservation of the racial stock itself. Irving Fisher, Report on the National Vitality, Its Waste and Conservation, 1908. This is another difficult uh, section to read, and the reason I Put it in here is it is it uh, reflects a part of the eugenics movement uh the the, the worry um it's even hard to say these words the worry of the flooding of the, of the genetic stock of america with uh with uh people from Medi mediterranean regions uh eastern europe and uh jewish um immigrants uh, th these were feared by by americans at the time for flood for altering the genetic stock of the nation and then and the Immigration Act of 1924 
greatly restricted the immigration of all those types, completely stopped immigration from Africa and Asia. Um, and so it, uh, it barred the entry of, of Jewish immigrants. This is, is a picture, I believe, from the 1920s. So I'm not sure whether this is before or after the Immigration Act, but the Immigration Act really stopped, stopped Jews from, from gaining refuge here uh, when Nazism spread across Europe. Uh, Art, the reason when, when World War II comes and, and, the, and Nazism, uh, that takes eugenics completely off the table. You can't talk about race theory and eugenics again. Uh, it's coded and you can hear sometimes, you can hear, the, you can hear influences today, but you can't just outright talk about eugenics and race theory in polite conversation today. Um, but conservation never really goes back and reflects on this and understands their involvement before the war and so never really looks through itself and, and asks itself, what are the influences of that time that might persist in conservation after the war? And so that's where we'll go next. Uh, is we'll see what, what, where race and conservation and many other influences shape conservation after the war. Oh, let me back up. So this is a, we're gonna go back to the main, main to the main uh, stream of conservation uh, for right now and, and look at, the, at, at two different aspects of conservation that are frankly very, very familiar to all of us. Uh, and one of them is the, is the preservation of wilderness and all its sublime beauty. Uh, which is personified in the, in the, in the career and the language of John Muir. Uh, and the other is a sustainable use of natural resources, which is really uh, what Gifford Pinchot spent his life uh, working for. And, and I want you to stop and reflect on these. These are, these are with us today, two radically different ideas about nature and how we relate to nature. One of them celebrates the ethereal beauty of nature and the talks about the uh, practical use uh, of nature for, uh, um, for human benefit, two radically different ones. And these, these come into, eventually come into conflict early in the 20th century when there's a proposal to take the Hetch Hetchy Valley, which you see un unaltered on the left, and to flood it to provide water for the, for the city of San Francisco. Uh, and so we have what we're going to listen to here are the words of Muir and Pinchot as they give you these two radically different perspectives on this possibility. Terry might be muted. All right, well, I guess I'll read this one just for now. Uh, Gifford Pinchot, Testimony Before Congress Concerning the Hetch Hetchy Controversy. Now, the fundamental principle of a whole conservation policy is that of use, to take every part of the land and its resources and put it to that use in which it will best serve the most people. I think that the men who assert that it is better to leave a piece of natural scenery in its natural condition have rather the better of the argument. But the considerations on the other side of the question, to my mind, are simply overwhelming. And I have never been able to see that there was any reasonable argument against the use of this water supply by the city of San Francisco. You might say from the standpoint of enjoyment of beauty and the greatest good to the greatest number, they will be conserved by the passage of this bill. And there will be a great deal more use of the beauty of the park than there is now. Hutch, and, this, and this is from John Muir's testimony before Congress concerning the Hetch Hetchy controversy. Hetch Hetchy Valley, 
far from being a plain, common, rock-bound meadow, as many who have not seen it seem to suppose, it is a grand landscape garden, one of nature's rarest and most precious mountain temples. That anyone would try to destroy Hetch Hetchy Valley seems incredible, but sad experience shows that there are people good enough and bad enough for anything. The proponents of the dam scheme bring forward a lot of bad arguments to prove that the only righteous thing to do with the people's parks is to destroy them bit by bit as they are able. Their arguments are curiously like those of the devil devised for the destruction of the first garden. These temple destroyers, devotees of ravaging commercialism, seem to have a perfect contempt for nature and instead of lifting their eyes to the God of the mountains, lift them to the almighty dollar. Damn Hetch Hetchy, as well damn for water tanks, the people's cathedrals and churches. For no holier temple has ever been consecrated by the heart of man. What do you think, Jackie? We're at 10 to 11 now. Do you want to take a five minute break now or do you want to wait about 10, 12 minutes and take a break? Yeah, let's do our five minute break now. Um, okay. So we'll come back at 10.55. If anybody has questions, now is a good time to ask and we can take a few of those. But if you need to go grab a drink or use the restroom, now's the time. Do you, want to, do you want to deal with any of the chat questions now or do you want to uh, just wait for those? Um, there weren't a lot of chat questions. Let me go I back and I, see if I missed I any. Thought I was... um, there was a comment from the beginning uh, okay. when you were talking about um, how do we make conservation more inclusive and you know make it 10 times bigger. Um, there was a comment to say, or 100 times bigger. That was me. <laughs> I was just yeah. I was just being positive. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, fantastic references. Hope we'll have access to the links. So we will send a PDF of the presentation to participants afterwards. Uh, let's see. So I went out of full screen and now I can't get back into full screen. I'm now I'm nervous. Uh, what is the problem here? We still hear your voice. Yeah, I know, but I can't see the um, I can't see the screen. There may be. Do you just see a little video like box? I okay. see view options. Yeah, under view options, there should be a full screen. Yeah, there should option. be, but I'm not seeing it. What the? There may also be exit minimized oh. view. I got it. Okay, I'm back. There you go. Uh, <laughs> we had a question in the chat. Prior to mass media, how were the messages of conservation disseminated to the public? Good question. I, I would guess newspapers would have been uh, by far the, the most rapid means of spreading information uh, around the country, at least prior to, prior to the radio. Um, um, Anyone, anyone else think of a think of a, an addition or to that? Newspaper? Yeah, newspapers would have been the, I mean, there were so many more newspapers and, and uh, that was really the only sort of mass media, at least, uh, yeah, mass media that was the mass media of its day. So I would guess that would, that would have been how, how ideas spread, spread rapidly across the country. Things like, uh, Turner's Frontier, uh, you know, his essay on the, um, I've forgotten the title of it now, but where, where he announces the Frontier Thesis, that would have been published and read all over the country, uh, you know, in the weeks and months uh, after, after he gave it. 
Well, the reason, part of the reason I asked the question was, yes, there were a lot of newspapers, but most of the newspapers in those days were handmaidens of commercialism. Uh, and I don't know how strongly they would disseminate the message. Plus, when you stop and think about periodicals in those days, um, except for like the penny press, uh, they were out of reach of the common people, you know, buying books, the library system wasn't that great. I, I, I just am wondering how, <clears throat> How this message got out to the public? How how did uh, how did Roosevelt's messages get out to the public? Um, uh, you know, it, it would seem to me that there are plenty of audiences in the elite who could afford uh, the periodicals to, to read and so forth. But just the general public, I was just curious about. And it's it's an open question. Well, it's, it's a good it's a good question. Maybe we all I'd have to do some we'd all have to do some more research on that one. I guess. Um. Actually, I'd like to respond to that question. There's a really good uh, fiction book about uh, the reader and apparently people would even make their living by uh, being able to read and they would subscribe to different periodicals and then they would go from town to town to town and charge a little admission to let people know the news of the world. Actually, that's the name of the book. And um, I, it, that might be the answer, one of the answers to your questions. I've never heard of that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I would say that's also what I've heard too, is that there would be like a town crier, so to speak. And to, to your point, like someone would read what was happening and, and just share. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all the questions we had in the chat for now is 1055 if we would yes. like to get started again. Okay. Well, the indigenous peoples of North America deserve, you know, a, a 20 hour session all of their own. I can't do that today. Um, you know, Native Americans are both, I mean, as an ecologist, I often find myself talking about Native Americans as objects or people in history and what they did. Uh, but they're also people alive today. There are Native Americans communities around our country today. So it's, it's that, it's, it's, the, it's the second half of that, most of us pe people in the dominant white, white culture kind of forget about because we don't interact with Native Americans on a daily basis. But the point of this section uh, is, is to talk about uh, how conservation of the dominant white culture understood Native Americans and then tried to fit them into a working idea of nature and wilderness. So it's, it's how, how Na Native Americans uh, became sort of part of the conservation story. Rabbit boy, so Indian myth. In the old days, before Columbus discovered us, as they say, we were even closer to the animals than we are now. Many people could understand the animal languages. They could talk to a bird, gossip with a butterfly. Animals could change themselves into people and people into animals. It was a time when the earth was not quite finished, when many kinds if mountain of mountains and streams, animals and plants came into being according to nature's plan. In these far gone days, hidden from us in a mist, there lived a rabbit, a very lively, playful, good-hearted rabbit. One day, the rabbit was walking, enjoying himself when he discovered a clot of blood. How it got there, no, nobody knows. It looked like a blister, a litter bladder, bladder full of red liquid. Well, the playful rabbit began toying with that clot of blood, kicking it around as if it were a tiny ball. Now we Indians believe in Takuskan Skan, the mysterious power of motion. Its power, its spirit is in anything that moves, inanimate things and makes them come alive. The rabbit got into this strange moving power 
without even knowing it. And the motion of being kicked around or rather the spirit of the motion. And I hope you grasp what I mean by that began to work on the little blob of blood and it took shape forming a little gut. The rabbit kicked it some more and the blob began to grow tiny hands and arms. The rabbit kept nudging it and suddenly it had eyes and a beating heart. In this way, the rabbit, with the help of the mysterious moving power, formed a human being, a little boy. The rabbit called him Wi Ota Wishasha, much blood boy, but he is better known as rabbit boy. Well, I guess first I have to answer the question you're all asking, which is why would I put a, a, a sort of crazy myth in a story about the history of conservation? Um, well, I put it in there because it's about as close to an original voice as you can find. Uh, first of all, this is really the only, the start of the myth that goes on, probably at least three times the length of this paragraph, uh, rabbit boy um, uh, is sent away by the rabbits and has to go to the, the only human village in existence at the time. He runs into, into trouble with the uh, residents there and, uh, and is conspired against by, among other things, Iktome the trickster. And, uh, but Rabbit Boy wins in the end. So the story has a happy ending. I'll, I'll let you know that you could look this up online and read the whole story. This is a really delightful version because it was told, this is, this is uh, recorded or, or transcribed from an actual telling of the story by a Native American. Uh, but I want you to look closely at the nature that that's here because it, it really, it's really not very recognizable to us. I mean, we, we can sort of look at it as a, as, a, as a white man in the early 21st century. I can look at it and be amused by it, but it's not, it's, it's, it's strange to me. Uh, it really comes from a time near the beginning. So the Sioux saw, them, saw themselves as a part of a sacred creation story. It's in the, so in the beginning, animals and plants could talk to one another, or they could even change back and forth between animals and plants. There's obviously a time after that where there's a fall from that original condition, uh, where perhaps only shaman could, could make that transition. Uh, and the most, one of the most fascinating parts is the animating spirit, which is, a, I, I give Raquel credit for trying to pronounce that, um, that, uh, that animating spirit that gives life to things that move. All of these are ideas that were embedded in, in indigenous cultures that are completely foreign to our culture today. And it's both interesting and fun to read this, but what it should make us take a step back and realize that they're the nature that they related to, that they saw around them and saw themselves as a part of was radically different than the nature that we conservationists think of today. So I will also add that these types of prayers or, or ways of acknowledging the earth were also common throughout Latin America in, in Mexico folklore. So it was a, a way of, of showing reverence and also respect of that we are one with creation and that at a time many of the gods were actually gods made in the animal or nature form at one point. So this prayer hopefully will, will touch your heart and show you a different way of how people respect the earth. So this is uh, Hodonashani, Thanksgiving address greeting to the natural world. Today we have gathered and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Now our minds are one. We are all thankful to our mother, the earth, for she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk about upon her. It gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. 
We give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Water is life. We know its power in many forms, waterfalls and rain, mist and streams, rivers and oceans. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the spirits of water. Now our minds are one. Now we turn our thoughts to the creator or great spirit and send greetings and thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on this mother earth. For all the love that is still around us, we gather our minds together as one and send our choosiest words of greetings and thanks to the creator. Now our minds are one. We have now arrived at the place where we end our worlds. Of all the things we have named, it was not our intention to live anything out. If something was forgotten, we leave it to each individual to send such greetings and thanks in their own way. Now our minds are one. Thank you. Um, I really, this is a beautiful prayer and it's a much, much, it comes from a much, much longer prayer. I would invite all of you to, to, uh, to look this up. Um, um, the, it, they give thanks to the trees, to the food plants, to the animals. I mean, it's just all, all many, many stanzas to this, this prayer and just a lovely one to read, but it's, it's, it, it is a beautiful and it's a very beautiful poem. I, I would say to, to remind yourself for me, I'm, I'm thinking of myself coming from outside of the culture that wrote this poem. Uh, it's challenging me to be able to say thank you to an in, inanimate object. What for me is an inanimate object like the water or the earth? Uh, this is this is a this is that 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 separation of cultures to me that's so fascinating. Um, as I look through the history of conservation, here is it's just a radically different worldview, beautiful, beautiful worldview, but radically different from the one that's the mainstream of American culture today. Speaking of John Muir. The man who thought of nature as a cathedral and regarded whales and elephants dancing, humming gnats, and even invisible small mischievous microbes as divine, regarded Native Americans as subhuman. Later in California, he called them dirty, garrulous as jays, superstitious and lazy. Justin Noble, The Miseducation of John Muir. How many centuries Indians have roamed these woods, nobody knows probably a great many, extending far beyond the time that Columbus touched our shores. And it seems strange that heavier marks have not been made. Indians walk softly and hurt the landscape hardly more than the birds and squirrels. From John Muir, Racist or Admirer of Native Americans by Raymond Barnett. John Muir is a complicated person, is, is one of the characters that as I was putting this together, uh, the more research I did, the more complicated any interpretation got. He, he is now, over the last, uh, I don't know, five, six, ten years, uh, people have identified a number of pretty nasty sounding racist statements that, that came from John Muir. And I don't think, I'm not going to apologize for them. They're there. They seem to be a part of, a part of John Muir's personality. There are those defenders of him who, uh, who claim that he had, at least particularly later in his life, a more enlightened view of Native Americans. But I, I know, I mean, my purpose in the, con in the presentation today isn't to label anyone a racist or not. Uh, I, I, that's, that's for somebody else to do. My, my point is, to, is to, look at, to look at conservation as a whole, to understand where, where the ideas come from and which ones of those ideas are still with us today and we just don't know where they came from. So that, that's the reason we're looking at it today. John Muir, it seems consistently was dismissive of the ecological importance of Native Americans, even if his ideas were respectful. Um, when you say the Indians walk softly and hurt the landscape hardly more than birds and squirrels, you're not really seeing them as effective ecological agents in the landscape. And it's a matter of, of historical record that he supported the removal of the remaining Native Americans from the national parks as they were created. So those two things are just a matter of, 
of record, uh, any final judgment on, on what label you want to put on John Muir is up to you. In the prairies burning form, some of the most beautiful scenes that are to be witnessed in this country, and also some of the most sublime. Every acre of the vast prairies, ferns during the fall or early spring, leaving the ground of a black and doleful color. There are many modes by which the fire is communicated to them, both by white men and by Indians, par accident, and yet many more where it is voluntarily done for the purpose of getting a fresh crop of grass, for the grazing of horses and also for easier traveling during the next summer, when there will be no old grass to lie upon the prairies, entangling the feet of man and horse as they are passing them. George C Catlin, 1842. Bruce Catlin was an artist who gave us to just, just Google his name and uh, start looking at images, just one image after another of, of the Plains Indians, uh, a, a visual record of them before, um, before their, their um, culture and civilization was, was destroyed. A remarkable, a remarkable life and career and, and gift to us in the present. I mean, we talk about Native Americans, the conversation often focuses on, on, on the injustices done to them and the theft of Native American land and their spiritual connection to the landscape. And those are both very, very important themes. I wanna highlight here though, their agency as, as ecological actors and their use of fire in particular. This is, a, this, is a, this is a fact about Native American history that will drop out of the, out of the sort of European American understanding by the end of the 19th century and early 20th century. And, and when, it, when, it, when it disappears, it doesn't disappear out of ignorance. It disappears um, because we had, to, we had to write them out of the ecological history of North America. As, long, as far back as 1813, Thomas Jefferson wrote something that seems remarkably modern. He said, Indian fire is the most probable cause of the origin and extension of the vast prairies in the Western country where the grass having been of extraordinary luxuriance has made a conflagration sufficient to kill even old as well as young timber. So this was a part of an understanding of many people, the Indians use of fire and the effect of fire on the landscape was a part of our of European American understanding of Native Americans throughout much of the 19th century. And yet at the end of the century, when we create the wilderness, it disappears. That to me is a, is a critical, critical thing to understand. The national park that never happened. This strip of country, which extends from the province of Mexico to Lake Winnipeg in the north, is almost one entire plain of grass, which is, and ever must be, useless to cultivating man, where live and flourish the tribes of Indians. And what a splendid contemplation to imagine them, preserved in their pristine beauty and wildness, in a magnificent park where the world could see for ages to come the native Indian in his classic attire, galloping his wild horse with sinewy bow and shield and lance amid the fleeting herds of elks and buffaloes. A nation's park containing man and beast and all the wild and freshness of their nature's beauty. George Catlin, 1841 from artist George Catlin proposed creation of national parks. So here is a maybe one of the first, I don't know if it's the first, but one of the first uh, first attempts to sort of conceptualize a national park. Uh, I hear Catlin is talking about a park that may seem a bit naive stretching from Mexico to Canada and encompassing much of what we think of as the Great Plains today, but, but nevertheless, uh, a conception of a park, but a park that's really quite different from the parks we ended up having. There's this park, the park that Catlin conceives includes the Native Americans in their way of life. And while the proposal may seem naive today, it's, it's important uh, to show that there were other ideas for national parks uh, other than the one we ended up implementing uh, later in the 19th century.
Necro, Shoshone, Anak, and Sheep Eater peoples frequented, frequented Yellowstone as they long had during the park's early years. Secretary of the Interior Lucius Lamar felt the new national park should be managed to preserve wilderness. In his mind defined as uncut forest and plentiful game animals. Because Indians hunted animals and set fires, preservationists came to view them as incapable of appreciating the natural world. The magnitude of the change of paradigms from Catlin's wilderness park inhabited by American Indians to the austere and pure uninhabited wilderness of Muir cannot be overemphasized. This shift deep peopled the landscape, not just in fact, but more incredibly in the minds of the general population. Ethnic cleansing and America's creation of national parks, Isaac Cantor. It can be confidently confirmed that stabilization is a universal tendency of all vegetation under the influence of the ruling climate. The natural inference has been that the prairies were much modified by the grazing of animals in the fires of primitive man. And this has been reinforced by estimates of the population of each. But the general habit of migration among the animals assured that serious effects from overgrazing were but local and transitory, while the influence of fires set by the Indians was even less significant in modifying the plant cover. Frederick E. Clemens, The Nature and Structure of Climax, 1936. Frederick Clemens was an extremely important and influential ecologist early in the 20th century. Uh, he wrote his first book, uh, I think in 1916, called Plant Succession, that this quote comes from a later book, but the ideas in the books stay pretty consistent through his, through his career as an ecologist. Um, and what he proposes by this theory is that it's a theory of nat, it's a nat theory of natural, a natural process, that vegetation changes through a natural process. Look at the word up here, under the influence of a ruling climate, ruling climate, so the climate is controlling this process of change. Um, and if it's a natural process, it's like gravity. I can't change the process. I can lift something up, but when I let it go, it falls down again. The process remains the same. And so if, if succession is a theory of vegetation, uh, and, we, and we imagine uh, that, that landscape is a result of a natural process, we more or less have to write Native Americans out of the story, don't we? I mean, if, if, if North America is what I call it now a cultural landscape, then any theory of vegetation would really be a theory of, of, of changing cultural land use over time. But Clements goes exactly the opposite way and really writes human beings out of the history of North America and says, no, the pattern of vegetation across North America is purely one of a natural process acting. So science, which we think of often as the as the, uh, the um, objective arbiter um, here lent its power to the depeopling of the American landscape uh, and the creation of, of wilderness. Until Columbus, Indians were keystone species in most of the hemisphere, annually burning undergrowth clearing and replanting forests, building canals and raising fields, hunting bison and netting salmon, growing maize, manioc. Native Americans had been managing their environment for thousands of years. American landscapes after 1492 were emptied, widowed by epidemic disease that killed the majority of their human inhabitants. The ecosystems shook and sloshed like a cup of tea in an earthquake. The forest that the first New England colonists thought was primeval and enduring was actually in the midst of violent change and demographic collapse. From Charles Mann's 1491, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus.
more one knows of its history, the, one, the more one realizes that wilderness is not quite what it seems. Wilderness hides its unnaturalness behind a mask that is all the more beguiling because it seems so natural. As we gaze into the mirror it holds up for us, we too easily imagine that what we behold is nature, when in fact we see the reflection of our own unexamined longings and desires. For this reason, we mistake ourselves when we suppose that wilderness can be a solution to our culture's problematic relationship with the non-human world. The wilderness is itself no small part of the problem. William Cronin, from Uncommon Ground, Rethinking the Human Place in Nature. When I first read this, probably 20 years ago, I saw it as, a, or read it as an obvious recognition of the agency of Native American peoples in modifying the landscape and our uh, mistake in, in, uh, in underestimating or discounting that. But I think it's a little bit more than that if you if you if you read it again. It's it's really an assault, really on the idea and idea of wilderness altogether. And I would particularly draw your attention to uh, to a phrase here where he says, our unexamined longing and desires. So we see the reflection of our own unexamined longing and desires. Well, but but who is he talking about? Is he talking about uh, the black person's uh, unexamined longing and desires? Is he talking about uh, the Latinx uh, person unexamined longing and desires? Is he talking about a Native American's long, uh, unexamined longing and desires of the Asian? I, I, I don't think so. And so, so when you when you when you read it now, now that I read this, it reads even even more uh, more critical of the wilderness idea because it's really I think. Um, identifies the way we have imposed a white culture's view of nature on the world and on conservation. And I think that's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the factors, I think, that looking at the history of, of conservation identifies for us today that, that we have been too, too willing to accept this vision of nature uh, that may be restricting entry into conservation by peoples of color and other people. The Dawes Severalty Act of 1887. Each Native American family was offered 160 acres of tribal land to own outright. Although the land could not be sold for 25 years, these new landowners could farm it for profit like other farmers in the West. Congress hoped that this system would end the dependency of the tribes on the federal government, enable Indians to become individually prosperous and assimilate the Indians into mainstream American life. The Dawes Act was widely resisted. Tribal leaders foretold the end of their ancient folkways and a further loss of com communal land. When individu individuals did attempt this new way of life, they were often unsuccessful. Farming the West takes considerable expertise. Lacking this knowledge, many were still dependent upon the government for assistance. From Life on the Reservations, the Dawes Act. The Dawes Act is a, is another uh, just another example of our uh, failure to understand how other cultures relate to the world and into land. And so when we when we uh, took Indian or Native Americans out out of their previous setting, we put them on reservations. They they began to starve to death and needed aid because we really undermined the entire basis for their culture and way of life and tried to impose on them the model of a, of a Jeffersonian small farmer, a sort of small scale agricultural capitalism and, and with a communal society that just failed. Uh, and so yeah, just another, another, another example of our, our failure to really understand how other cultures relate to the landscape. Oh, wait a second. Land Health, Aldo Leopold, a Sand County Almanac, 1949. The most important characteristic of an organism is the capacity for internal self-renewal, known as health. There are two organisms who, 
whose processes of self-renewal have been subjected to human interference and control. One of these is man himself, medicine and public health. The other is land, agriculture and conservation. It is now generally understood that when soil loses fertility or washes away faster than it forms, the land is sick. The disappearance of plants and animal species without cause, despite efforts to protect them, and the eruption of others as pests despite efforts to control them must, in the alternative of simpler explanations, be regarded as symptoms of sickness in the land organisms. So Aldo Leopold is really, I mean, to me, the colossus of 20th century conservation. He is, uh, he, he pulls together these two threads of conservation, the, the preservationists and the utilitarian, seemingly uh, impossibly different ways of looking at the world. And he pulls them together into a, into a single view and is universally admired in both camps. That was a remarkable achievement. Uh, land health, I must say, land health is, has always been an idea I've been rather critical of and I'm critical of it um, because it, it is, uh, for one thing, it's so intuitively obvious and appealing that it's almost uncriticizable. Um, who, who, could, who wants to be sick? I mean, it's something you feel deep down in your gut. You want to be healthy. And so the idea of health in the land, of course, you would want the land to be healthy also. But, but I think because of its, its, its very appealing nature and, its, and the fact that it can't be criticized, it's, it seems to me it's hiding rather than revealing why I or you or many of you have dedicated your life to, uh, to conserving nature. I mean, it, I, 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 I just don't buy that as, as, a, as a reason why I'm, I'm a conservationist. It's an attractive idea, but I don't think it's quite as powerful as it's given credit for. Unkindness to anything means an injustice done to that thing. If I am unkind to you, I do you an injustice or wrong you in some way. On the other hand, if I try to assist you in every way that I can to make a better citizen and in every way to do my very best for you, I am kind to you. The above principles apply with equal force to the soil. The farmer whose soil produces less every year is unkind to it in some way. That is, he is not doing by it what he should. He is robbing it of some substance it must have, and he becomes, therefore, a soil robber rather than a progressive farmer. George Washington Carver, Being Kind to the Soil, 1914. <clears throat> Wilderness is the raw material out of which man has hammered the artifact called civilization. No living man will see again the long grass prairie where a sea of prairie flowers lapped at the stirrups of the pioneer. We shall do well to find a 40 here or there on which the prairie plants can be kept alive as species. There were a hundred such plants, many of exceptional beauty. Wilderness is a resource which can shrink, but not grow. Creation of new wilderness in the full sense of the world, word is impossible uh, from the San County Almanac 1949. Well, John Muir may have at least may have been central to, to pulling together this idea of the wilderness. Um, Probably no person is more strongly identified with it, and no one cemented it the center of conservation culture more firmly did, than did the work of Aldo Leopold. Um, note, note to hear that Aldo Leopold is coming back to that same metaphor of the relationship of civilization to the wilderness, uh, or, or of us today to the wilderness. Here, here the man has hammered uh, out of the wilderness, the artifact of civilization. When Turner talked about it, it was the, the, the wilderness creating 
the modern American character. That relationship is so has such resonance in American culture and our relationship to the to the wilderness. I note also the familiar lament here of the vanishing wilderness that it can shrink but not grow. Wilderness, uh, it seems obvious to me, in Leopold's mind was a was a fragile, priceless remnant of, of an inhuman world. This, as the Negro speaks of rivers, one of my earliest poems written in 1920, just after I came out of high school. The way this poem came to be written was that I was going to Mexico to visit my father who lived in Mexico City, and on the train going across the Mississippi River, just outside St. Louis, I looked out the window and I saw this great muddy river flowing down toward the heart of the south, and I began to think about what this river meant to the Negro people, how, in a sense, our history was linked to this river, how in slavery time, my grandmother told me that to be sold down the Mississippi was one of the worst things that could happen to a Negro slave. And then uh, I remembered that I'd read about Abraham Lincoln going down the Mississippi as a young man, and he went on a raft to New Orleans and he saw human beings bought and sold in the slave market there and he was so horrified by this that he never forgot it and many years later of course we know that it was Lincoln who signed the Emancipation Proclamation and so uh, as the train went on into the gathering dusk because it had been about sunset when we crossed the river I took my father's letter out of my pocket and began to write down on the back of his letter this poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. It was a rare opportunity. That comes from a, a recording of Langston Hughes at a, at a talk he gave at UC Berkeley back in the late 1960s. Uh, it's a much longer recording. If you look for it on YouTube, you'll find it pretty easily if you type in the name and, uh, and, and look, look for videos or, or uh, recordings of Langston Hughes. Uh, this, was, this was a turning point for me when I saw this poem. First of all, it's just a beautiful poem and I read it several times. It's just so evocative. Uh, um, just grabs me as a poem. And then I, later on, I found the recording. Uh, but, but this, this is, you could say, not a poem about conservation, but it is, a, it is a poem about a connection, a deep, deep connection between human beings and nature, uh, a deep soulful connection between people and generations. It's, a, it's a, just a beautiful poem. Now, I often thought if, you, if you're looking for the voice of a person of color, uh, as they speak about nature, this is a good place to start. Um, it is a, it, it's a powerful, powerful poem. In order to assure that an increasing population does not occupy and modify all areas within the United States, leaving no lands designated for preservation and protection in their natural condition, a wilderness is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain, an area of undeveloped land retaining its primeval character and influence without permanent improvements or human habitation. The Wilderness Act of 1964. 
Wilderness Act is a landmark piece of legislation, and it's a very important piece of legislation. Sometimes it seems like I'm being too critical, but I can be critical, but the act itself, the fact that we would set aside areas as wilderness and set, set them aside from industrial and consumptive uses is incredibly an important part of conservation history. But if you look at the act, it does, uh, has the perverse effect of, effect of cementing an unpeopled primeval wilderness untrammeled by man in the popular imagination. So, I mean, this is the question. It's not a question I can answer. It's a question we all have to think about. How do we move beyond the limitations of that word um, that's utterly blind to the theft of land from native peoples and the er their erasure from ecological history? There's just no way you can get around that, that when you talk about the wilderness idea that, that, that has been central to the conservation, uh, the whole conservation movement. I grew up in a small town in North Carolina where most of the white people were farm owners and the black people were hired hands. My family farmed and as a child, we'd go out fishing and hang out on the rivers as a family, but we were never encouraged to go far from the house. The feeling was, if you're black, if no one's around, you might not end up coming back. Even now in my position as chair of the local Sierra Club chapter, I will still only go on hikes when I'm with a group of people I know. I live within walking distance of a nature trail and I would never go there by myself. Marjorie Leach Parker. I, I, I selected this quote because again, it shows this very, very different point of view on nature, expressing a love of nature and yet, and, yet a, and also a fear fear, if not of nature, of what can happen to you in nature. Uh, so different from the white experience. I, very, very quick story. This, this uh, Marjorie is about my age. Uh, and so in the, the childhood she's talking about was, was at the same time as my childhood. Uh, and in the early 60s, about 1964, I lived in Nashville, Tennessee on the south side of the city, just uh, near a little creek called Seven Mile Creek. And this was where I sort of discovered nature and wandered along the creek by myself or in the company of one friend for several years. Uh, it's just absolutely essential to my life as a conservationist today. No one ever told me not to go there. My father, who I admired and, and uh, idolized, um, and from whom I, I got my love of nature, I think, he never said, don't go there, there son, that's dangerous. But what if he had? What, what, if, what, if, what if I hadn't had that experience early in my life? I think, I think I would have ended up growing up to be a very different person. I'm gonna skip this section, Jackie. I just, I just think we need to move on more quickly. So I, my apologies to the people who are gonna read this. Uh, a source of hope. Um, I read I read whole books for that section, but I really feel we need to we need to move on. Uh, hope 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 for what? Hope for what? Well, we could all hope that extinction the the, the growing wave of extinctions uh, we can learn to slow that down or stop it. We all hope that we can stop climate change or slow it. Uh, we hope we can stop the acidification of oceans. We all hope we can stop the further degradation of what little fragments of nature are left in the world today. We certainly all hope for that as conservationists, but this is, this is a slightly different hope I wanna talk about here because it's hope for a conservation that we can, we can manage to put together that would actually be able to address those problems. In 1952, Dorothy Buell founded the Save Dunes Council for the purpose of preserving the remaining dunes as additions to the existing but small Indiana Dunes State Park. Today, the Save the Dunes Council continues to be active. Their mission is to preserve, protect, and restore the Indiana Dunes. She famously said, we are prepared to spend the rest of our lives, if necessary, to save the dunes. National Park Service. Dorothy Buell is an interesting character, a woman who led a woman's group. She uh, lived in Ogden Dunes, which is a sort of fluent uh, little white community right along the lakeshore, beautiful setting, uh, now surrounded by the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. She led, led this effort for 14 years, 
fought for the Indiana Dunes. And without her and without that women's group, there, 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 if there were a park at the Southern, well, there would have been a state park already, but really quite small. If there were, if there were any larger park in that area, it would be much less spectacular than it is today because it would have come about 10 or 20 years later. Dorothy Buell was responsible for really carrying the torch on that idea for 14 years before it was picked up by Paul Douglas, Illinois Senator, and finally made law. Conservation comes from a lot of, it's not strange places, unusual places. Uh, uh, it doesn't always come from the halls of Congress. There's a women's group uh, in Indiana that creates a national, what is now a national park. Why should we tolerate a diet of weak poisons, a home and insipid surroundings, a circle of acquaintances who are not quite our enemies, the noise of motors with just enough relief to prevent insanity? Who would want to live in a world which is, not, which is just not quite fatal? The road we have long been traveling is deceptively easy, a smooth superhighway on which we progress with great speed, but at its end lies disaster. The other fork of the road, the one less traveled by, offers our last, our only chance to reach a destination that assures the preservation of the earth. Rachel Carson and Silent Spring. Rachel Carson was one of the founders of the modern environmental movement and the book centered on, it was an attack on the unregulated use of pesticides in particular DDT. Uh, Rachel Carson's work and, the, and the, the reaction to it was probably instrumental in saving the bald eagle from extinction. The beautiful birds that we now are seeing increasingly frequently in the modern day. Uh, and Rachel Carson probably forever changed the way we feel about industrial chemicals and about people feel about their food. We, we, we don't have that unblinking uh, trust uh, in the economy and in industry and in technology to, to have our best interests at heart, we're watching them. Uh, in the modern day, uh, that, that resistance to pesticides has caused some friction between the environmental community and ecological restoration community. And I think that's understandable, but I would, I would caution people on both sides because I've seen both sides of the argument uh, that it's uh, potentially divisive and can fracture and diminish and impoverish both movements. I think we need a little bit more understanding there on both sides, really, of, uh, of, the, of the genius of both movements and how, how the two can support one another. I woke in the middle of the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in the beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought or of grief. I come into the presence of still waters and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting for their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and I am free. With all Barry piece of wild things. Wendell is a poet uh, farmer in, uh, in Kentucky. Um, this poem reminds me a great deal of the, uh, of the, um, oh, it was the second poem by Paul Dunbar, that short, beautiful poem about the meadow. Uh, it has that same feel to it. And if you look through Wendell Berry's poetry, because he was a farmer, that place of, that nature is a part of human life is everywhere in his poetry. Ecological restoration has its roots really early in the 20th century, uh, coming from academic institutions, but it really starts as a popular movement and really becomes a, a, a popular movement of hundreds and thousands of people, really in the 1980s, as far as I can tell. Uh, and it was really a response to, I think, a lot of people, mostly volunteers, just, uh, just uh, nature lovers looking and seeing that things were disappearing. They were looking at a world that was disappearing in front of their very eyes and they started to take action. Uh, I mean, there's, it is a revolutionary idea. Ecological restoration is a revolutionary idea. It, it supposes that people can fix nature and that goes radically against the central wilderness core of the conservation movement that really sees 
nature is separate and apart from people. And if you remember Leopold's words, you can't make any more nature. Well, what are we doing then? Uh, so in the, even as late as the 1970s, public agencies were paying young people to plant multiflora rows and, uh, and honeysuckle to feed the birds. And by the 80s, they were paying them to remove them. And by the 90s, uh, the, the volunteer stewardship network had expanded to thousands of people. So it was, it was an idea whose time had come. If civilization consists of cooperation with plants, animals, soil, and men, then a university which attempts to define that cooperation must have, for the use of its faculty and students, places which show what the land was, what it is, and what it ought to be. It is with this dim vision of its future destiny that we have dedicated the greater part of the Arboretum to a reconstruction of the original Wisconsin, a sample of what Dane County looked like when our ancestors arrived here in the 1840s from the dedication of the University of Wisconsin Arboretum in 1934. So Aldo Leopold uh, sort of christens the, 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 the prairie restoration, the beautiful prairie restoration. You should go there if you haven't, if you haven't seen it. Uh, and it's well worth, worth your time to go there. Uh, but Leopold really never gets involved in the restoration. And while he does some restorative act uh, on his farm near Baraboo, he's never really a, a, a part of the, of the restoration or speaks about restoration for the remainder of his career, as far as I know. Um, one, one is at least reminded of his idea that creation of new wilderness in its full sense of the word is impossible. Just how satisfying was the idea that you would make, make nature? I, I do wonder about that with Aldo Leopold. He died at 61, so there's a lot of questions we can ask about and we can never answer. What would he have said in later life um, about ideas like this? Uh, I guess we'll just never know. A number of people are concerned about protecting some of the less obvious features of the environment, those which affect man as an intelligent being capable of learning, understanding, and appreciating. There is a growing feeling that in addition to scientific and economic needs, man may actually require the diversity and complexity of a rich natural environment for the full development of his cultural potential for a wider range of recreational activity and quite possibly for the long-term mental health of the human species as a whole. Ray Schulenberg, Prairie in a Post-Prairie Era. To Make a Prairie by Emily Dickinson. To make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee, one clover and a bee and reverie. The reverie alone will do if bees are few. Well, I had the good luck to, uh, good fortune, I should say, to, to, to meet Ray Schulenberg. I, I started work at the Martin Arboretum back in 1990, worked there until 96, and Ray had retired the year before. I came there, so I met him on several occasions and talked to him. Uh, and if anyone has ever uh, talked with Ray Schulenberg or been around him, you know, of his fierce Fierce dedication to native plants and native landscapes, his tireless and unflinching and uncompromising attention to de detail in the what's now the Schulenberg Prairie Restoration, and I so I thought it was just uh, on, on, uh, I just couldn't help but put this wonderfully simple poem of Emily Dickinson right next to it. And I want you to highlight this this idea here that. Um, intelligent beings capable of learning, uh, appreciating. There's a growing feeling that man may actually require the diversity and complexity of rich natural words. This is echoing the idea of Muir when he talked about everyone needs beauty as well as bread. Those ideas, those tropes in conservation just come back to us time and time again through history. We're gonna skip this one and go and we're gonna skip this one too. We're gonna to go right to here. 
surprising you on that, the readers? The primary goal of district natural ecosystem management efforts shall be to maintain and reconstruct the best possible approximations of native communities by restoring natural ecological processes, structure, and composition. On some sites or portions of sites, natural ecosystem management goals shall encourage preservation of enhancement of native biota already supported by the land or water in its man-modified state, especially if limitations imposed by land use history exist. The natural ecosystem management goals shall be integrated with the site educational and recreational goals. McHenry County Conservation District, Natural Ecosystem Management Policy. The Forest Preserves focuses on conserving natural and cultural resources in concert with each other and on both the people who are doing that work and those who benefit from it. Effective conservation requires understanding those resources, understanding the place or context in which they are found, and understanding the history, traditions, values, and attitudes of the people living in that place. Ultimately, it depends on a shared understanding of the problems facing the region and a shared commitment to improving the conditions for the people, plants, and animals living there. The Natural and Cultural Resources Master Plan 2015 for the Forest Preserves of Cook County. We're going to take what? this one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, Laura, that's that's go. go to Joanne here. Um, Joanne, you're muted. I'm sorry. Do you mind unmuting and repeating that? It is a woman's business to be interested in the environment. It's an extended form of housekeeping. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Time Magazine, 1983. Marjorie Douglas was a, was a journalist, author, uh, conservationist, and particularly a staunch defender of the, of the Florida Everglades. And she boils, she boils conservation down to housekeeping. What a wonderfully simple form. And I want you to just, just think about that. I mean, and uh, Compare that to the, the apocalyptic scenarios we often hear of melting ice caps and coastal flooding and ocean warming, acidification and mass extinction. Uh, and just think for a moment about which one is the rational response. Perhaps both are. I don't expect everyone to feel the same way that I do about land. For so many of us, the scars are still too fresh. Fields of cotton stretching to the horizon, land worked, sweated, and suffered over for the profit of others, probably don't engender warm feelings among most Black people. But the land, in spite of its history, still holds hope for making good on the promises we thought it could, especially if we can reconnect to it. The reparations lie not in what someone will give us, but in what we already own. The land can grow crops for us as well as it does for others. It can yield loblolly pine and white oaks for us as it has for others. And it can nurture wildlife and the spirit for us just like it has for others. J. Drew Lanham. I want to stand by the river in my finest dress. I want to sing strong and hard and stop my feet with a hundred others so that the waters hum with our happiness. I want to dance for the renewal of the world. The trees act not as individuals, but somehow as a collective. Exactly how they do this, we don't yet know. But what we see is the power of unity. What happens to one happens to us all. We can start together or feast together. Rob, Robin Wall Kimmerer, she's a professor of environmental and forest biology at the State University of New York and a member of the Potawatomi Nation. Braiding sweetgrass, indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teaching of plants. We're going to skip this one today. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I think we just have to move on more quickly. Uh, in nature, nothing is perfect and everything is perfect. Trees can be contorted, bent in weird ways, and they're still beautiful. The animals of the world exist for their own reasons. They were not made for humans any more than black people were made for whites 
or women created for men. Alice Walker, who is also the author of The Color Purple. Kathy Carthen had been interested in trees all her life, but it was her love for her home and her neighbors that sprung her to action. When her once tree-lined neighborhood of Bedford, Studio Vincent in Brooklyn started losing its trees at an alarming rate, she started replanting them herself. At the age of 71, Kathy founded Tree Corps to inspire young people to care for and plant trees. This is from the Nature Conservancy, African-American leaders in science and conservation. Why should organizations consider gender and conservation? The conservation movement largely aims to protect nature for the well-being of people, ensuring that the users of natural resources, whether it's men or women or boys or girls, have the right opportunity and ability to participate in decision-making and projects affecting those resources is a moral imperative. The ability to participate in the decisions that will affect your life and livelihood is a fundamental human right. Kane Westerman in Why Gender Matters in Conservation, 2017. I was muted, I apologize. In the long run, it is clear to me that conservation will succeed only if it can support the goal of a dignified life for all humans and non-human species. Prakash Kashwan, University of Connecticut, American Environmentalism's racist roots have shaped global thinking about conservation. I'm only gonna read a, a short excerpt of this, but this yeah. picture is from how people are reclaiming vacant lots in the Chicagoland area through the land trust um, garden neighbor space. Gardening by- well, I'm sorry, I just yeah. wanted to yeah. see the image. Go ahead. Um, gardening by Rena Expellent. My hands are in the dirt, 10 finger nails black with it and half worms come up to wreath in the hole I've made with a rusty trowel. I nudge them out, drop them where shade is deeper and moister. Nothing to be alarmed about, I tell them. There's enough dirt for all. Roots from our neighbor's greedy birch caught on the wrong side of the fence, drop their booty of damp clumps from black sweaty little fist. I pat them back under, dig a new hole. If I don't see you, I don't know you, you're there. I tell them, do as much for me someday. Thank you. Wall that's, walls that divide sacred places. When Lisa Manuel was a child, her mother would take her to Quito Paquito Springs, a rare oasis amid the giant cacti and rolly hills of Southwest Arizona's Sonoran Desert. For at least 10,000 years, the spring had been a vital source of water for wildlife and people, including the Tohono O'odham and Hyatt O'odham whose ancestral territory spans the U.S.-Mexico border. It's been a part of my family all my life, says Manuel, a descendant from the Hyatt's old Tanhem. It's a beautiful place. It's a sacred place. I sit there and I pray. Audubon, the border, wall, the border wall has been absolutely devastating for people and wildlife. And this wall kind of represents a full circle of how racism, impacts what continues to impact our conservation efforts. I'm interested in the way that a man looks at a given landscape and takes possession of it in his blood and brain. Where this happens, I am certain, in the ordinary emotion of life. None of us lives apart from the land entirely. Such an isolation is unimaginable. We have sooner or later to come to terms with the world around us. We Americans need now more than ever before, and indeed more than we know, to imagine who and what we are with respect to the earth and sky. One effect of the technological revolution has been to uproot us from the soil. We have become disoriented. I believe we have suffered a kind of psychic dislocation of ourselves in time and space. 
we may be perfectly sure where we are in relation to the supermarket and the next coffee break, but I doubt any of us knows where we are in relation to the stars and to the solstices. And yet I believe that it is possible to formulate an ethical idea of the land, a notion of what is and must be in our daily lives. And Scott Monaday, American um, ethic. And Scott Monaday is a, is a Kiowa Native American writer. Uh, this has really been a journey. This is a journey, a very brief, quick journey through the history of conservation. It's a strange journey through strange places. Uh, and we've only been able to glimpse some of the some of the major themes that came together to create the conservation we all enjoy and participate in today. We do it together with other people, uh, with whom we are all we are different from every other person, but we all share share a greater number of similarities. We've created as a conservationist many brilliant ideas and institutions, and I don't want to. Uh, uh, to diminish that in the least. It, they're, they're, the, the national park system is a brilliant creation. It may have its problems. It was a brilliant creation. Um, but we've taken some wrong turns and we've hurt people along the way and we've turned others away from the conservation movement. And that's a bad thing. Most importantly, we can begin to address these problems today um, simply with honesty, humility, thankfulness, and courage. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. We uh, promise to keep you until 12, but we will stay on and answer questions. Um, so if, I'll start reading some of the questions from the chat. So thank you for your patience. I was saving some of those just so we could make sure to finish the slides in case anybody had to go at 12. Um, so I'll read those. And then uh, there's also the option to type in the chat again at the bottom of your screen with the chat button, or you can unmute yourself and ask. Um, we had a comment from Amy that the Thanksgiving prayer may also show up in braiding sweet grass. And thank you, Raquel, for answering in the chat that yes, uh, the full is it the full poem is available in braiding sweet grass. I see a lot of nods. Okay, I believe it is, and I want to thank Tom for this wonderful opportunity, and to you too, Jackie, and to Marcy who connected me. Um, I learned from Tom many years ago, and I'm yeah, glad well, to I see remember. him again. Thank you. you. So thank you for yes. coming. Too. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all. Um, we had a question from Mary. Was Hughes writing about nature or culture? Well, I think that's a good that's a good point because I think he was writing about both. And I think that's the, the, the problem is that our culture tends to associate, tends to split those two apart into sort of unreconcilable differences and you appreciate nature, but you appreciate it at a distance as an observer, as an objective observer. And I think, I think Hughes was really looking at it from the, again, from the inside much in a very different way, but much as, as, as a, the Native American myths and things, seeing nature from, a, from an inside point of view. I think, I think when you look at, often you look at voices of people of color, maybe I'm reading it into this, but, but it seems to me they're seeing nature their connection to nature is through the lives of people and, and the connections between generations, place and culture. And, and so I, I, I think we, the division between the two that seems so absolute and obvious and logical to us is one we've imposed on the world and we need to back up and realize that and maybe have come up with a conservation movement that embraces more than just that. Um, uh, we had a, Another question from Mary on the Marjorie Leach Parker quote. Um, was she talking about being a black woman or just being a woman? Um, I, I remember reading that she said, you know, if you were black in there, yep. the idea was you may not come back if you went out in nature. Um, she, feel free she, to add. She's an African American woman who, who wrote that. And, and I think it, it, I mean, I've, I've run across that idea many times in doing research for this that, that we can ignore so easily as, as, a, as, a, as a white man that I'm not afraid when I go out in nature. I mean, I, I just go out all by myself all the time and wander around in nature, but, and I, but I didn't grow up being told to be afraid of nature or to be afraid of being alone in nature. And it's just, it's just a cultural experience. It's something that I grew up with that not everyone grows up with. And I think that quote by Marjorie uh, 
Leach Parker obviously enjoys nature, it just highlights that. Um, will the recording include the sections you had to skip over here? Um, so the recording won't because it will be just the same as today, but the PDF that we send out will have all of the readings so you can peruse them. So thank you guys for uh, letting us skip a few of them last minute just to, yeah. to make sure we finished yeah. on time. I apologize to people that had actually practiced them and I just felt like it was important to try to get it done by noon. So yeah. no, no comment on your reading ability. Jackie, can I ask a question? Yeah. Tom? <clears throat> yes, yes, Joe. While, while I was watching this and listening, I kept seeing types, divides, uh, genders, classes, them, us. And I was, it made me think of a quote from uh, Shakespeare. And uh, it's from Troilus and Cressida, uh, Cressida by Ulysses. And I, it's uh, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. I don't think Ulysses or uh, Shakespeare may have been talking about all of nature, but that all men are have a common nature and that they're all kin, they share feelings. My question is, can we expand that to include all of nature, that we are all kin, whether a bumblebee, a tree, a man, a woman, whatever, American native, is it is that's going to save the world when we see, when we're touched by nature and realize that we are all kin, all of nature. I'm glad you said that, Joe. I mean, I think that's that's probably something like that is probably a part of a, a conservation movement can embrace a broader number of points of view. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not pretending that I know what the future of conservation needs to be. What I've tried to do is to show the boundaries of the conservation we have today, some of its limitations. We, not, not me, but we need to work our way around that. And some of the ideas that you just talked about, Joe, may be a part of that solution. I just think that conservation needs to not to see itself as contained within the institutions of the day. We can use the institutions of the day, but we can move outside of them. We can broaden the movement. We can try to embrace other ways of, of relating to the world and nature as a part of that movement, I think that's that's really essential if conservation is going to grow uh, dramatically in the future, which it needs to. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we make this divide between us and wilderness. How do we how do we tear down that fence? We you know mm -hmm. that border. I don't know. Can we? Well, I well I I think I think in that in that instance I think we can. I mean, there are other things that I'm I don't know. Honestly, if I can ever, maybe I can, maybe I'm just selling myself short. Can I ever actually pray to a tree? I should be able to, but I mean, not just stand in front of it and say it, but actually address a tree as another being. That's something that culturally limits me. I can try, I can try. I'm not dead yet, so I can always hope for the future. But there are certain, there are certain things that we may not, we may be, need to embrace multiple kinds of cultural points of view for that new conservation and not restrict it to one. I think that maybe that's that's part of, I think, what the new conservation would be is it embraces a broader number of cultural perspectives. You, you know, what's kind of interesting. I was a truck driver for Jay Freight and for so many years, I drove past all your conservation sites. Didn't even know they were there. It wasn't until I retired and my daughter gave me her dog to walk and I took the dog for walks that I realized that I was part and Eleanor the dog was part of nature and that we were all neighbors, brothers or sisters. I, I'll, 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 but I had to get out of the truck to realize that the way I was living, the way we maybe all our living human beings is totally unnatural. We are kin, all of us. <laughs> My dog, daughter's dog, Eleanor, the, the bees, the, the uh, May apples, you know, we are all kin. And I think that's what we have to realize. We got to get off that truck. We got to get off out of that car addicted to acceleration in our sick hurry to get nowhere. 
and get back to nature. Anyway, I'll shut up. And <laughs> thank, thank you, thank Joe. You, Joe. Yeah. We do have a few other questions, so I want to make sure we get to those. Um, Jim asked, has there been a golden age of conservation in the United States? How would you rate our nation's conservation efforts with other countries? Well, the second question, I don't know that I'm adequate to really judge them sort of quantitatively better or worse. Uh, the conservation movement probably in the, in the sense of a public conservation movement, it got started earlier in this country. Uh, but it's those same ideas like the word national park looks different when it goes to the UK. Most of a national park is privately held land uh, and all the park status does is, is, it, is it puts certain um, restrictions on what people do within the park and they have to apply to a, to a board to, to, for approval for, for improvements to their farms. So, and we can, when we export national parks to the, to the, uh, to the tropics, uh, we, we often find that those ideas that seem to work in our country don't work there. The conflict between national parks and indigenous peoples ends up, which was a, was a problem in our country, which we sort of erased, uh, becomes a problem when that national park idea is exported to other countries. So there's a, there's a very interesting, there's a, there's a whole interesting you know, novel there about the conservation movement worldwide and how these ideas move around the world and look the same, but look different in other places and how the, where they seem to succeed brilliantly and where they fail, but I'm, I'm not really the one to uh, Judge, what was the first part of the question? Um, has there been a golden age of conservation? But well, Raquel unmuted, all... so did you want to add on to his thought before he answers the other one? No, I was going to wait for him to answer that and then put in my two cents. Okay, the golden okay. age. I, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, if you'd asked me that question five years ago or something, then I probably would have said at that time when the national, the, you know, the national forests and national parks and the growth of federal lands and, and then the state parks and all that. And in one sense, I mean, one of the things is that this has taught me, it's been a journey for me. It's taught me that along with the very good things that happened, there were things that happened that weren't that good. There are things that happened that restrict conservation today. So I don't know if I can identify a golden age. You can see periods when the idea of public conservation spreads around the country. And that's important to what conservation is today. I wouldn't have a job today if it weren't for that, neither would Jackie or Raquel. But, um, but still, those same times were troublesome times in other ways. Go, go ahead, Raquel. Yeah. So I'm going to push that question back to you, the golden age of conservation. And for me, it would be when Native Americans were living among the land. So, so think about that, like pre-colonization, that was the golden age of conservation because unfortunately, imperialism, Euro European imperialism or colonization is worldwide and it continues to happen today. So this thought about the US com comparing ourselves to other countries or other developed countries is that because of colonization and the way it's extractive and the way that Western thought sees itself away from nature, it continues. So we continue to, ex while we protect land here, we continue to extract from other countries as, as well because we are protecting our national parks. So then we go to Brazil and extract resources there. So, so think about it in that way is that how, does the U.S. influence other conservation efforts worldwide? Well said. Let's see. Jenny is holding up a book title there. <laughs> you can't read it. Open Veins of Latin America, looks like. Okay. Yeah, that's a good book. It, it's very, again, this other way of thinking of where we think of people coming here as the bad people or as 
you go to other countries and Americans in the U.S. are the bad people, are the ones inflicting this foreign policy onto them. So, Would you repeat the name of the book, please? It's The Open Veins of, of Latin America. Okay, I you. think someone was holding the book title, so. Jenny, you can unmute and say the name and the author if you like. <laughs> Uh, Open Veins of Latin America by Eduardo Galeano. And I believe he was from Paraguay. Let's see. But to uh, uh, embellish or to add to what Raquel already knows, is that I think that the basic problem in conservation is the attitude of uh, First Peoples had towards the land, which they were stewards of it, and it was sacred. And the uh, newer scientific thinking of the Europeans who came over uh, was conquering nature, and that that was a good thing. And uh, uh, we are seeing that the first peoples have a good point, I think. First peoples, and not just the first peoples of America, but Canada, Central, Mexico, South America, the whole new world, that was the basic clash of cultures that happened when the Europeans came over. So yeah, that's and, my bit. Yeah, and, and there are still indigenous oh. cultures worldwide. You know, there's the Sami people in Scandinavia and- Yes, the Sami, I have a friend who is a Sami. Yeah, and it's also in Asia. So, so First Peoples is, is very right on. Global, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Um, we had a couple of comments. Um, Mary mentioned, not sure which slide this was in reference to, but Ethel Untemeyer is also a woman who took on many to form Lake County Forest Preserves. Um, we had a comment of Love Wendell Berry's writings. Uh, sorry, you had something to add. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big Wendell Berry fan. So. <laughs> I couldn't um, in there. And a couple uh, excellent presentation, Tom. Thank you so much. Great research. Um, <laughs> I feel that this presentation should be expanded into a PBS series. I think a wider <laughs> audience would benefit. Um, I'll take calls when they're in the call. <laughs> Another thank you. It's been a privilege to participate in this presentation. Mm. And a uh, question from Brandy. Any thoughts on where Christianity and other faith traditions enter into the conversation? Uh, my faith inspires and informs all the decisions I make with regards to how I treat other humans and non-humans in the earth. But I don't hear many people talking about this intersection of faith and religion. That's a, that's a wonderful question. And it's one that I, uh, that I obviously think about a lot. Um, it, it, it actually does. You know, I come back to that quite frequently. I was raised in a church tradition. I attend church now, and I and I'm and I'm I'm alternately encouraged by it, and sometimes I feel like there's just that Christianity has not um, has just basically missed the boat and doesn't and just can't quite get their act together. So I don't know. I don't know. I would like to think Christianity in general and and certain certain sects within it could could strongly embrace this idea, uh, but I'm I'm not sure. I'm I'm honestly not sure. Okay. Um, a couple more thank yous. Got to get out to my prairie restoration work. Um. <laughs> say, well, at least I inspired some positive. Uh, yeah. Thing, yeah. Um. I always wander around nature too, but as a woman, I bring something to defend myself, uh, mainly a phone. Um, I, I can relate to that. I think that's in reference to when we were talking about that Marjorie Leach Parker yeah. reading. Um, I know it's different having the perspective of a woman walking around alone on a trail sure. versus um, being a man or some things yeah. safety wise <laughs> that occur. It's somewhat a difference in times. I'm not sure that parents would let little boys 
walk off for three or four or five hours at a time by them today it was a different a different age but but this but, but the ages were similar i was i was wandering along that creek when marjorie was was about my age and wandering around in north carolina so I, I, that's what it just it resonated with me when i when i read that i just thought about my own experience and how how did it shape me but it would have been it could have been very different yeah several other thank yous a comment, when my dad was a young man in the 1930s, he took part in the Civilian Conservation Corps building trails in Oregon. His experience stayed with him for the rest of his life and he passed his love of nature and conservation to my brother and I. We could do yeah. all the talks on the Civilian Conservation Corps. That would be a great one. Yeah. <laughs> um, interesting and expiring. Uh, I'm working, so I missed a little bit of it, but thank you. Um, and that is the last comment that I have in the chat. Okay, well, I thank everyone for coming today. It was a, it was a, it's a hard one for me to put together, but very satisfying. Uh, I feel like I learned a tremendous amount. I hope, hope you learned something. You can look through the PDF and it may will give you a lot of resources to learn more if you like. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming today. And uh, yeah, everybody go out and restore a prairie. <laughs> thank you for coming thank you Raquel for okay. collaborating on this with us yes thank and, you uh, I'll particularly thank you to the readers today that was yes, thank you very much yeah. all right have a good bye. day guys all right bye bye, bye.